The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com. Empire. There is no team in I. So what happens now to youth sports? And the, and the first way we approach that is to recognize there's an emerging youth sports industry, right? That there is uh, the professionalization of youth sports should not have a bad name because it's, it's instead of being a hobby, there are people that are doing this like Logan and Tyler that are committed to this, that are invested in standards and training and, and, and making sure sports is accessible. That's Jeremy Goldberg, president of League Apps. One spring season, gone. So how did the organizers of youth sports shift to stay engaged with athletes everywhere? This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. There are a lot of economic and social casualties of the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you're like me and have active kids, one of the things you lost this spring was their sports seasons. Today, we're gonna have a vibrant conversation with three men whose livelihoods are youth sports and how their organizational and connective skills are being tested. Plus, when they think we might all just be allowed to play again. So there are no spring sports anywhere in the country. No one can get together and players are asked to figure out how to get better at home. Parents are trying to figure out how to homeschool and everyone's trying to figure out when sports are going to come back. So let's have a roundtable discussion about what's going to happen next in the midst of the coronavirus outbreak with Jeremy Goldberg, who's the president at League Apps, an online management and registration software company for youth sports. Tyler Kreitz from Advanced Lacrosse, that's A-D-V-N-C Lacrosse. He's also the director of lacrosse at Sierra High School in San Mateo, California. And Logan Kosmalski, who's from Pro Skills Basketball, one of the co-founders, uh, obviously t- uh, Tyler and Logan are working specifically in their sports. Hi, guys. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. Hey, Jeremy, let's start with you here and just let's just get kind of an overview before we get specific to a couple of the the sports that we can talk to Tyler and Logan about. But just a general sense of life in sports now, specifically youth sports, as you kind of try to figure out how and what to do amid the outbreak of the virus. Yeah, I think the easiest way to describe it, Brem, is that uh, someone's hit the pause button on all of youth sports, right? And at some point, someone's going to hit play again, but no one's exactly sure when that's going to be. And so for now, every organization, every local community that was operating is trying to adapt to this new reality. Uh, first and foremost is trying to make sure their communities are safe, be a resource to that community. Second is trying to be innovative when we think about virtual training uh, and the ways in which they're, they're building their culture and, and impacting the lives of the kids in their programs. And third is getting ready for, for the day after, because we know that when, when, when this economy starts to, to open up again, youth sports will be on the earliest side of that, um, of that curve, that economic activity curve. And so if we can, we can be ready for that moment, I think these organizations uh, will be ready to go and I think can kind of lead the way back. Um, Logan and Tyler, and I'll start with you, Logan, from kids who are playing basketball and their families as well, um, what, are, what are they asking of you right now as they try to move forward here? You know, surprisingly, Brent, it's been, it's been pretty quiet. I think you know, we've kind of come to the conclusion that people have other things going on and, and more important issues to deal with right now. Um, but there is, we, we've tried to be as proactive as we can with some of the ideas that you and Jeremy have mentioned when it comes to the online training and just keeping in regular contact with, with our members and our players and our coaches. Everyone's kind of just playing the waiting game right now. And we've seen a really positive response Um from our communication, just trying to be an open as, and, and honest as we possibly can. So right now it really feels like we are in a waiting period as well as all of our parents, players, and coaches. And, and Tyler, from the lacrosse point of view, what, what are you hearing from the people who, who take part in that sport? 
you know, it's, it's somewhat similar in that there are many other things that the families are dealing with. However, what they're looking for from us and looking for a lot of them in their sports clubs is something, a, a healthy diversion. How can you help um, us essentially handle our kids? Because, you know, everybody's in this, uh, in this situation where you have kids at home who need an outlet, who need a social activity, who need some engagement from somebody who's not their parent, who's not their immediate family. And so what they're looking for from us, based on what our interactions have been from our marketing and outreach that we've done directly to our city, is that they're looking, they're looking for more, hey, what are some drills we can do? What are some things we can do? Can we get on a Zoom call with our teams just to say hello? Um, so what they're looking for us is the same thing they look for you know, during normal times, if you will, but now they want it in a more virtual mode. Um, and I think that need for community, that need for connection, that need for athletic endeavor is still there. It's just now we have to deliver it in a completely different way. So I, I would say what they're looking for is it hasn't changed. It's just how we deliver it has. Um, let me stay on that topic with you for a moment, and I'll have the others weigh in as well, because a lot of times when we talk about training, the mental aspect of it is a huge, huge, huge part of this. Of course, that's normal times. Um, health and wellness is a big issue right now. And it seems like something, Tyler, that you're alluding to here, that, that we need to be very cognizant as leaders in the sports state space to understand that health and wellness is, is extremely important at this juncture. Oh, absolutely. You couldn't, you couldn't, I, I forgive me. I just almost jumped out of my seat because it's become a big topic for us. Even before this was going on, it's like how health and wellness play into sports and how sports, uh, both enable and allow kids to deal with their mental health, any sort of mental health, for lack of a better word, issues they have because there's a physical outlet and activity there that, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? It stimulates the brain activity that allows you to sort of get through those tough times. It teaches you those life lessons of how to deal with uncertain situations. And so you use that in sports where it's really kind of an artificial construct. I mean, because the reality is, when you're on an athletic field during normal times, it doesn't really matter once you get off. But now those lessons that you've learned from sports, now things matter. Now things are real. Now things, the life, the, the things that we're dealing with right now are, 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 they're not tangential. They're directly in front of us. And so the lessons we've learned from sports have been more and more valuable. And so we've been trying to share those lessons with our families and point those out even more so, while also addressing the underlying issues of mental health that get masked by athletics and get masked when you're playing a sport because sometimes if you are struggling in your own head the, the initial feeling for many athletes is i'm just going to tough this out like i tough out a, 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 a hurt ankle and that's just that is inherently destructive because it just it just it, it, mental health isn't something that you can kind of tough it out you gotta you gotta you gotta you can't white knuckle your way through everything and sometimes you need to acknowledge it acknowledge the issue just like you acknowledge your hurt ankle and and seek help and so Forgive me for going on here, but I think this opportunity or this pandemic, this crisis has offered an opportunity for sports organizations, for sports in general, to acknowledge what mental health, one, how sports can help in mental health, and two, acknowledge the real issues here. So we don't just have, fall back on those old issues of, um, you know, rub some dirt on it or you have nothing, you know, you got nothing to worry about, kids. Um, I, I think that's, that's something that we've been uh, focusing on and trying to address. Logan, are you seeing similar things um, in the mental health space in basketball right now? Absolutely. I was just about to you know, chime in with, with what Tyler mentioned. Is I, we did a webinar yesterday with a, uh, a guy named Stu Singer, that's a performance coach, uh, works with some NBA teams and some NBA teams. And he had a really, he put it in a really interesting way is that, you know, he looks at like the four pillars of performance, like technical, tactical, uh, psychological, and, and physical. And how we spend all of our time really practicing the technical and tactical when it comes to practices and game strategy and on the court work. Um, but he viewed it almost just like Tyler says, like, what a great opportunity right now. Well, we can't focus on those pillars of our performance that we can focus on the psychological. Um, we have time now. We have the, uh, the energy to sit down and, and, and work on these mental, uh, you know, internal habits of the way we think and how we handle performance that, um, this pandemic has, has opened up an opportunity for, for us to focus on those things. And the same thing from a parent's perspective of, you know, now that we're not on the court in these crazy environments, um, how can I help my kid? How can I, how can I help my child become, uh, 
become a better competitor, but also like look at what we're going through. How can I help them deal with the loss of the, the ability to to compete and the loss of the, the the connection with their teammates and the social interaction? So it's um, it's provided a great opportunity, I think, to, to focus on things that are normally overlooked. And one thing that came up in our team call today, we have a is in, in the same context of silver linings that have that have uh, come about is. I don't know about you, but out here in the Silicon Valley area, there are a lot of kids that are just overscheduled. Mm-hmm. And the stripping away of the activities has allowed more free time and free play. And we've seen that in lacrosse, especially kids are coming and showing us videos of, hey, I'm entertaining myself. By, I'm working while no one is watching. And I'm making a, I made up a wall ball drill. I'm sure in basketball, it's like, look at this, you know, dribble mm-hmm. drill. I've just decided to, you know, mess around with in my backyard. And again, it's going back into that free play, free exercise mentally freeing type of activity that is so beneficial for kids. And it's, it's something I hope doesn't get lost once you go back to normal. So, um, you both were using the word opportunity a lot. I found myself using that in the media space as well. Um, there is opportunity here. It feels a little bit like the wrong word. Like we're not trying to take advantage of what is a horrific situation, but opportunity seems like the only word that kind of fits. And in the case of entrepreneurship and organization, Jeremy, Um, It it seems like that everyone's got to think outside the box here in terms of survival of small businesses, but there is opportunity there to recreate what you do. Um, Does that kind of resonate with you? Yeah, it does. You know, I found myself, I think yesterday, sharing the the Muhammad Ali quote, which is a man who views the world the same at 50 as he did at 20 has wasted 30 years of his life, right? And I think the analogy here would be, how are you going to go through this experience and not waste it, right? As much as there's tragedy, as much as there's challenge, you know, at the same time, I think there's an opportunity to think about where, where, where can we improve. And, and, and I think about the youth sports ecosystem. I think there's three things I draw from this. One is the absence of sports, I think, reminds us of the importance of sports, right? And so I think being able to use that as a way to engage more people and increase more participation, which has been a recent challenge in terms of participation, participation rates, is important. The second is, I think the skills that you learn in sports, I think as you heard Tyler and Logan speak to, are things that can be better used now and, and drawn out, right? It's the, the idea of resiliency that you learn through handling adversity, the ability of what it means to be a teammate, uh, the ability to, to understand uh, the idea of sacrificing, like the, the, we're as a country being asked to do. There's so many different things you're learning in the context of this that I think help you understand the larger, broader uh, life lessons and value of course. And finally, I think there's a more tactical opportunities that uh, talented organizations like Advanced or, or ProSkills are using in this window. And, and that might be the mental performance side of things. That might be integrating technology, which is an inevitable trend, to deliver experiences that are even better and more impactful for kids. That might be better improving the capacity of your organization through training of your coaches or developing your methodology. And then ultimately it might be uh, thinking about uh, the, the you know, new forms of play, as, as Tyler was alluding to this, the free play that you might integrate in your program. So never waste a crisis. And I think the, the, the you know, you know the professional athletes right now, uh, LeBron James isn't wasting this moment, right? Uh, you know, Giannis isn't wasting this moment. They're figuring out how to get better themselves. And I think that's true of the youth sports organizations that are really these youth sports professionals that are going to be there for their communities afterwards and I think have an opportunity to thrive. And, and, and that, that's what I'm excited to see because we know that sports is one of the things at the professional and youth level that can help bring this country back from this crisis. Up next, more of our conversation on the future of youth sports, including how the business of organizing the leagues has potentially been altered permanently. This is the Future Sport Podcast. Welcome back to this special Future Sport Roundtable on the future of youth sports. Let's pick up our conversation with Jeremy Goldberg of League Apps, Logan Kosmalski from Pro Skills Basketball, and Tyler Kreitz from Advanced Lacrosse. And our focus here is on the business and how that's changed. Um, I want to ask this of all three of you, and I'll start with Tyler. It's really just a very simple question. How has your business changed in the midst of all this in terms of short-term and long-term strategy? You know, I, I can just simply state it as, you know, and this has started before the crisis, but it's been accelerated since, is as sports organizations, you change from being a sports club to being a youth services organization. 
and it goes into a holistic approach and holistic model. How are we developing young men of character and conscious and passion for this sport and using sports as a vehicle to deliver that? And I, I don't want to say that we've changed, but rather it's, it's made even more important why we do what we do. And so from the high level, that's what I think is, it's been uh, something we've been focusing more on because we can't see these kids. We can't just focus on drills and for, and, you know, plays and how you, you know, how you defend a guy at, at X. It's rather about how do you develop yourself as a human and as a good person and how do you come through this and using sports as a vehicle to do it. Um, on a very, on, on a micro level, we've become a content provider and a content and an interactive content provider in a way that we hadn't done before, but it's been really interesting and really neat. We, we are, you know, we're lucky and we're large enough that we have a professional organization behind with us. You know, we have individuals who aren't just focused on, you know, how, we, how we're going to design the next play, but rather how we're going to deliver our services. And those people have begun to shine. Our marketing director has been, and, and our training director has been out of sight with their content they're being able to produce and get out to our family. So, you know, in summary, I would say at a macro level, how do we continue working in a holistic approach to the to the uh, to the kids, and at a micro level, delivering of the content and interacting with our families in a more digital way? How about you, Logan? Yeah, I was going to. I mean, Tyler took the words right right out of my mouth. My mouth is actually what's remained the same as our values and, and our commitment to to helping and, and serving our kids, but the tools by which we do that have become different. You know, like, like Tyler said, we've become essentially a content company and. Um, trying to maintain connections. So we're, we're trying to deliver the same leadership and the same values, just using a different medium. And that medium has become Zoom and it's become Instagram. Um, and it's become phone calls and text messages. And uh, another way that's changed, with, like Tyler said, we're, we're large enough where we have you know, a marketing director and we have a staff of some really good committed people. Um, but you know, roles have changed in, in the ways in which we communicate and um, as an internal group have really changed. That, that's been a, a huge challenge as the leader of the organization is to maintain and, and inspire, um, you know, the, the unity amongst our you know, internal group that we have to, you know, stay committed to our goals and establish some different roles and, 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 and figure out a way to build a new bike as we ride it while also maintaining uh, our connection and our commitment to our players. So in some ways it's been like starting, starting from zero. Um, but in other ways it's, it's been, um, let's adapt to some new roles and let's continue along our, our mission. How about for you, Jeremy, how has league apps changed here? Yeah. So, well, well first I, I can see that this is challenging for us financially as it is every uh, youth organization for profit or nonprofit. You know, our, our business model is we make money when they make money as part of that transaction. And so all of us, I think, are hurt. So there's this notion of survival to then thrive, survive to thrive. And so I think one, one is we're in a fortunate position based on the success of the business to be able to ride that out, but really trying to that, that our customers, uh, again, for profits or nonprofit, are able to do that. But, but I, I thought about it, and I invoke kind of the perspective of Jeff Bezos here from Amazon, where, you know, a lot of people would come to him and say, you know, what's going to be different about the world in 10 years? Uh, and how do you build a business around that? And, and his advice was always, that's the wrong question. The question is, what will be the same in 10 years? And then use that to drive your business because that's how you build long-term value. And so I think the core assumptions that we have is that people, and especially kids, are going to still love playing sports on fields, uh, in courts, in the real life, notwithstanding anything they might do digitally. That sports will still have to be organized to make that happen. And then increasingly technology and data are going to have an important and integrated role in that experience. And then people crave community. That goes back to you know, our caveman impulse, impl uh, uh, impulses and this idea of belonging. So if those things don't change, then the real question is, is what is the opportunity for us as an organization to respond to that and be better? And, th and the first way we approach that is to recognize there's an emerging youth sports industry, right? That there is uh, the professionalization of youth sports should not have a bad name because it's, it's instead of being a hobby, there are people that are doing this like Logan and Tyler that are committed to this, that are invested in standards and training and, and, and making sure sports is accessible. And so I think one of the things is, is how can we serve that industry? And so whether that's virtual town halls, whether that's resource guides, whether that's information on mental health and performance, we're constantly thinking about what are the things that we can do, and it's amazing to have five and 600 people, organizations that are joining our weekly events virtually. And I think ultimately that will translate into a permanent community that we'd already been working to build, but that's been accelerated, whether that's on Slack or LinkedIn or, or Instagram. 
the ability to kind of cultivate that sense of community around youth sports and recognize that if we work together, it's the way that we can address what was, what was, what was working about youth sports and make that improved and, and also address some of the shortcomings of it. And then lastly, as a technology company, we're doubling down on our product development and using this opportunity uh, to continue to figure out how can we innovate and provide technology here as well. So you, you can't waste this as an opportunity, but you also can't, uh, you can't lose sight of the fact that there's something fundamental to sports that's not going to change. And so we're going to continue to use that as our, our North Star in what we do. Uh, Jeremy, on that, on that part about the tech, um, can you be specific at all about what you guys are working on now to try to improve the tech for youth sports when they do come back? Yeah, I think the two, two examples I'll give is one, you know, you see a world of, of youth sports that's becoming increasingly mobile, right? About 60% of the interactions in our platform and therefore the interactions that any organization is going to have with parents is going to be from a mobile device. And there's a transference of expectations where a parent where you can go into a Starbucks and not wait in line and grab your coffee, that, that in terms of the technology experience that, that you care about. So, so the first is, is how do you continue to make that mobile experience better uh, and more seamless and put those tools in the hands of organizations to really build up their capacity to meet the expectations of parents and kids. The second is that there is an unbelievable of, a proliferation of technology that could serve an impact use sports being developed specifically for this sector and others. So how do we facilitate those kinds of inter interactions uh, in, 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 in integrations in our platform, really viewing ourselves as that operating system layer where these other kinds of tools can be leveraged on top of that. And so that's the second place that we're looking, including responding to some of the opportunities that are more pronounced now, like virtual training. And then lastly, even as we build those technologies, I don't, we don't lose sight of the fact that, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a divide in terms of who could access sports before. There's a divide in terms of who has access to certain types of technology. So how do we build in and with, with that kind of accessibility in mind? So, for example, if people don't have computers at home, the mobile solutions we have can make an impact. Uh, the other program that we're continuing to focus on is how to give our software away uh, to qualified nonprofit organizations that otherwise couldn't afford it, where there's going to be even more of them right now as well. So I think we're trying to respond holistically with our technology that ultimately makes people like Tyler and Logan so much more effective because we know when they, they have more time and more capacity with it. Um, let's get into the opportunity and the necessity now, which is virtual training. Um, Logan, let me start with you. Um, how have you guys either shifted to or added on to your virtual training in the midst of the pandemic? Our main focus right now is just to, to keep that connection with, um, with our players that have, you know, agreed to play with us at, at a, now during this time and in the normal time we'll be, we will be playing. So a lot of live social media events, a lot of Zooms, you know, special Zoom workouts per team. Um, and it's kind of gone from something that started off as like, let's just give this to our members for now, but like to how do we create this and package it and potentially use it as something to generate revenue should this crisis go on for, you know, an extended, extended period of time. Um, so it's, it's become our main focus. We're testing out um, different ways and different mediums and different platforms that we can use right now. Um, and different ways of producing them. So it's, again, we've, we've become a content producer and we've had to focus on audio, visual, uh, cameras, equipment and settings and things that are, you know, we've, we've done those things in the past, um, but they've become our, our main focus right now. We've really had to put an emphasis behind not only how do we create these things, how do we make them look um, and feel and sound up to a certain standard, but also how do we get eyeballs on them and how do we continue to produce them at a high level and, and, and get more people involved. With them. Tyler, how do you, how do you see uh, virtual training from the lacrosse point of view? I mean, it's, 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 it's very much the same as Logan. I mean, although our timeline is slightly different um, and in the sense that right now we are, in the process of just developing the content and trying to provide it to our families all and everybody for that matter for free. Um, because our season, if you will, is delayed. Our season doesn't really start until summer and then runs through fall winter. So as a content producer, we're in the process of trying to produce the content, make the content and then get it out to people. So they have that. Um, so we become that more of that trusted source for it, more of that trusted guide for people who may not have interacted with us before. Um, monetizing the content and going down that path is something we're certainly looking into and how to become a, and now that there's, you know, platforms like Famer, for instance, that allow you to monetize and even uh, create a more immersive experience for the you know, virtual trainees, you know, that there's a definite opportunity there. It's something we certainly want to explore. 
but we're, our first primary concern right now is to produce the content and get it out to our current family and any other families who are part of our extended community so we can provide something of value to them. Um, so I, I guess to answer your question, we're in the first phase right now of just mass production and getting it out there. And then, if you will, the freemium model, and then go to yeah. the, uh, if we can, and it makes sense for us, which I think it will, um, then go into that uh, more premium model where people will be able to pay and interact with us in a more, uh, more intricate detail. After this short announcement, more of our conversation about the future of youth sports, where we ask the question, when will kids be playing again? This is the Future Sport Podcast. The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3 Advance. So let's take a moment to thank our friends at 3 Advance. These guys are ranked one of the nation's top app developers. Their user experience and cloud expertise has helped grow a bunch of sports tech startups, including Team Builder, T-Box Tour, and In-Game Fantasy. So if you're looking for a development partner to bring your future sport tech to life, look these guys up. Go to 3advance.com. They're the team to make it happen, and advance you will. That's the number three, advance.com, and tell them Future Sports sent you. Welcome back to our Future Sport Roundtable, devoted to the future of youth sports. Our guests are Jeremy Goldberg, president of League Apps, Tyler Kreitz from Advanced Lacrosse, and Logan Kozmalski from Pro Skills Basketball. The focus of the conversation, the focus now turns to the future and a question that no one really can answer right now. I mean, obviously, as we speak here, nobody knows when it's coming back. You all are hoping in the summer when lacrosse season would start. Obviously, basketball is hoping in the winter when all of the leagues would start in high schools and the youth leagues as well. Um, Jeremy, just overall, I don't know, timing's the wrong way to put this, but how do you see youth sports coming back in what fashion? Yeah, you know, I think um, my perspective is a few things. One, any seasonal assumptions you may have had about youth sports are probably out the window. Because even if you had certain seasons that you would typically see that sport, especially where more and more of the club and travel programs operate closer to year round, uh, these organizations are eager to continue to pro- get out there and program and make up for lost time, make up that revenue. Uh, support the organization against for profit or nonprofit. And so one is I think you're going to see a bunch of people all trying to open up programming subject to having the actual space or availability in courts to make that happen. So that, that's number one. And I think parents are going to be glad to get the kids out of their home into whatever program they can as soon as possible. I can say that for sure as the, as the parent of two kids that I am, uh, I am currently quarantined with. Uh, the second is I think the, the, the question of timing, you know, I believe that youth sports will be on the earliest side of where the recovery is. Again, part of that dimension is, you know, before I'm excited to go to a restaurant or decided to go on a, a flight somewhere, I'm, I'm probably more excited to do something for my kids. And so I, I think that they'll, you'll, you'll probably see something that will happen in parallel to what's happening around the school system, especially if a lot of the organizations are renting space and fields from schools or potentially tied to municipalities that might be using that as a guide. And there may be some regulations around that in terms of gatherings and, and, and kind of precaution of the space. Uh, but given the transmission rates that have been low around, uh, at least the, the, the risk to kids themselves, if there's a way that this can be figured out to come back and the CDC kind of advises on it, it does feel that youth sports will be in the earliest side of that, of that uh, sense of normalcy that will return, even if it looks a little bit different, even if the tournaments are a little bit smaller, even if it looks a little bit more like private instruction uh, than other kinds of gameplay. And I, I think the entrepreneurial nature of these organizations will be to adapt and to start to get kids on the field however they can. Um, let me get your thoughts, Logan and Tyler, as well, because w- largely basketball is an indoor sport. Obviously, you can play outside, but largely what we're talking about, the leagues, it is indoors. And uh, obviously, lacrosse is maybe not professionally indoors, but largely played outdoors. So let, let me start with you, Logan. Um, from the basketball point of view, what is your opinion of how and when leagues come back and kids start playing basketball together again? Yeah, I think going off of what Jeremy said, I, I think it's, it, it's going to look different. What exactly it, it's going to look like, like we don't know. Um, I, I just have a hard time believing um, that the massive tournaments with hundreds of people crammed into a, you know, three, four court facility um, is going to happen this summer. 
Um, that just doesn't feel right to me. And, um, you know, but, but that's not to say that we can't practice with the team or hold a scrimmage with 20 kids and, you know, live stream the game so that parents can watch or we can get smaller group workouts together or three on three tournaments, you know? Um, so we're just trying to think about what could possibly happen and where we could possibly hold it. And, you know, if the CDC says it, you know, no groups of 10 or more, what does that look like for us? And, and the good thing about basketball is it, it can still be played outside, which, you know, as a, as a basketball purist, um, <laughs> kind of excites me to, to get kids back on, on outdoor courts and, and out in nature playing, playing the game, um, as opposed to such a structured indoor, um, crazy environment that we see at a lot of these tournaments. Um, so we, we, we're, we're kind of all over the map when it comes to looking, you know, months down the road, but we're, we are trying to make plans for things that hey, if it's this size of group, then we can be only be outdoors. This is, this is kind of an option of what we can do. Versus, hey, you know, tournaments are, are doors are open, these facilities are operating, and it's it's game on again. Um, we'll be ready for that as well. So, you know, the short answer is we, we don't really know. We're just um, trying to trying to think about the different possible scenarios and and what our operations would look like. You know, should smaller groups be, you know, be opened back up and allowed to just gather together. Tyler, how's it how's it look from the lacrosse point of view? Um. You know, right now everybody's in uh, in the lacrosse world, it's, which is so based around the summer tournament circuit. Um, things are being pushed back, and right now everybody is contingency planning for tournaments that will run in a very short window from end of July through beginning of August. Um, before, you know, hopefully, and this is all again speculative because we don't know what's going to happen. But people are planning for that window compared to be compressed out. Um, so, in the immediate short term, people are planning for a later and delayed summer and hoping for that. Long term, and for you know, if you look at the bigger picture, the reality of people just like Logan said of wanting to get together in massive tournaments in the middle of Long Island, that appetite's probably not going to be too uh, there as much. Or going back to DC or Maryland right now, um, or going to any heavily populated area um, for the foreseeable future may not be the most attractive option. So, for some of the tournament providers, they're going to have to rethink of how they do things, and as a club. We need to rethink. Okay, what are how are we going to get our competition and our our um, our kids to go out and have those experiences? And are they going to be more regional and localized? And are we going to be able to you know co- collaborate with guys who are in our backyard or in our state that we can drive to? Um, and those types of things. So you know we can forego families having to travel through airports and travel on plane when they may be a bit hesitant. We're going to be looking at a more hyper hyper local and hyper regionalized thing. Um, and you know, one thing that aspect of this is this goes back to you know what Jeremy was saying about the there is going to be a pent up demand. Um, what's also going to be interesting to see is there's going to be a pent up demand, but are there going to be enough providers that make it through this to match the demand? Um, and that's going to be the other thing that's going to be interesting to see is like you know there's going to be a lot of people who want to do this and a lot of a lot of kids who want to play. But are there going to be enough organizations around after this all goes through because of the financial implications that are going to be able to provide what these kids want or need or what these families want or need? Um, yeah, just to so ladder, how does ladder, that affect? Yeah. yeah, I was just going to ladder up that, that Tyler, because I think you know, Brian, one thing that, and to understand is you know, I do expect there to be a lot of consolidation out of that. That was already a trend that was happening. Organizations were emerging for various reasons or dynamics. Uh, and, and there are a lot of organizations that are struggling, uh, like all small businesses are. You know, some of the most popular content sessions that we've done recently has been how organizations can understand the CARES Act. I would never have thought that I would have the rapt attention of hundreds and hundreds of organizations about the difference between a 7A and a 7B B SBA loan, right? Mm-hmm. Or payroll tax credits. But uh, you know, the livelihood of these organizations, the coaches that are associated with, uh, you know, are, are really at, at risk here. And, and, and certainly the danger is that what's being developed in Washington, when they think about small businesses, are really being capitalized on different kinds of businesses uh, and isn't being translated or available for these, this, this kind of sector, given notwithstanding its importance. And so I know one of the things we're looking at is ways to, to try to translate this and, so that the organizations can survive, so then thrive. But there is a huge risk of consolidation that could make sure uh, make less experiences available for sports in specific communities, uh, something to watch for. Um, all right, let me leave you with this last topic, and it, it kind of falls in line with, with what you're talking about here. Um, consolidation 
And you know, we'll go back to the idea of opportunity, which I would think, since we're all in this together, that is there an opportunity, Jeremy, in your point of view, um, for crossover and maybe more crossover of interest across sports and sports spectrums now that everyone is home and trying to figure out how to spend their time? Yeah, it's, 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 it's the, I think what, what's fascinating to me is there is different trends that were happening. And I think to your point, there's an opportunity for the, to think about convergence, right? On one hand, you have this idea of esports that a lot of people looked at as an alternative to youth sports. And I think now people are saying, well, wait a second, there may be ways of incorporating things that are interactive, that are gamified, that are leveraging technology that the same way that youth sports or the esports took the best of youth sports and brought that into that environment of leagues and games and tournaments. What are the ways to bring the same kind of interactivity and engagement into the youth sports experience, right? I think the second thing is, is, is there a consolidation of programs that might allow for more multi-sport programming or different kinds of form programming, programming or integrations of free play with organized play? I think there's the promise of that as well. And then lastly, I think there's the potential of technology as these organizations, organizations get more used to using things like Zoom or Slack or Famer or League Apps. Uh, what are the advantages that come along with that? And so I think that there is an opportunity to leverage those trends for youth sports to be better, but I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. I think it's going to require leadership of organizations like 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 Pro Skills and, and Advanced, uh, and and certainly we want to play our sport, our part at League Apps. Uh, and I think it also takes for creative thinking about reimagining what this industry can look like, uh, as opposed to simply assuming it's going to go back to normal. And I'm just ready to get out of my house. So, and I think we can all agree <laughs> to that, <laughs> young or old, let's get out of our house. Uh, Lo- Logan Kozmalski <laughs> from uh, Pro Skills Basketball, Tyler Kreitz from Advanced Lacrosse, and Jeremy Goldberg from League Apps. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. That will do it for us this week. As always, the future is now. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com.